Chapter twenty six of Curly by Roger Pocock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrari. Chapter twenty six The Stronghold. My words are only crawling for lack of wings. My brain's like ashes when it needs to be live fire. I have no brains or words to talk of what I've seen, and I reckon I'm a lot incompetent. The men who wrote the Bible ought to be turned loose on this earth again to make another book then folks who have not seen might understand such places as the painted desert the rock city and the grand canyon of the colorado what with delays in packing and driving i had to track curly for maybe thirty miles before i caught her up at clay flat by the edge of the forest her horse was dead and she sat beside him her stone-white face set cold staring straight ahead below us lay the painted desert so wide that the further edge was lost in mist we rode down to the trickle of water at the bottom then up the further side and all the rock lay in belts red as flame yellow as gold purple as violets which seemed to shine of their own light burning us the men who stop in that country mostly go mad the which is natural Beyond, we came out on a mesa of naked rock and sand drifts, where we found a pool between high cliffs, splashed through it, and maybe a dozen miles beyond found, after nightfall, a few plants of grass. We had covered a hundred and ten miles at a tearing pace that day, changing horses, robber fashion, at every halt we made. Next morning, we met up with small bunches of Navajo Indians, a strange breed of people dressed up in their private brown skins, with great plenty of turquoise necklace, silver harness, and a wisp of breech cloth. Riding with bows and arrows to hunt rabbits, they handed a few arrows after us, but their ponies could not run, so we quit their company. Then we came to the city of rocks, flaming red and high as mountains, their thousand-foot walls sheer to the desert, all carved in needle spires, towers, castles, palaces. The street was six miles wide, I reckon, and we rode along it maybe fifty miles, like crawling flies in the sand. Beyond the city, we curved around by a gap in the desert, a sort of crack half a mile deep, with a river along the bottom. It swung about like a snake, getting deeper and deeper, but we kept to the level desert, until we reached a little side canyon where there was feed and water we resaddled there taking curly's buckskin and my pet horse sam the rest of our bunch we turned down into that pasture and left them riding on along the rim rock just after sundown we came abrupt to what looked like the end of the world a gulf so deep that we couldn't see to the bottom that mighty gash in the earth is six hundred miles in length it's usually ten miles wide it's more than a sheer mile deep and a full of mountain ranges all shaped like gigantic buildings dead weary as i was from riding more than two hundred miles in forty-eight hours i forgot about being tired when i saw that place the most tremendous thing in the whole earth the grand canyon of the colorado there was no rest for us but seven miles of such a breakneck trail as i'd never imagined possible for it overhung black death from start to finish looping round the face of outrageous cliffs which seemed to have no bottom midnight was past before we got to camp beside the river flung off the harness turned the horses loose and dropped in our tracks to sleep a gunshot roused me and starting broad awake I heard the echoes crashing from wall to wall. It's only me, said Curly, signaling. Dark banks of fog were driving over our heads, and I shivered with the dawn cold. Then I looked up, and more than a mile in the air saw scarlet cliffs ablaze in the sunlight. The river rolled beside our camp, wide as the Thames in London, gray water so thick that splashes of it harden into mud. A gunshot answered from the further bank. Then Curly gave the cougar war howl. The yelp of a wolf came back. 
both boats said curly are on this side of the river something gone wrong cook breakfast while i cross she took a little crazy boat and towed it upstream scrambling over boulders a quarter mile or so from there she pulled the boat across the great gray sluice fetching the other bank after a half mile drift downstream there was a strong backwater along that further bank and she pulled easy drifting past the camp up to a rocky headland the man who had answered the signals was waiting there to throw his saddle into the boat and follow leading two horses so they could swim behind by the time they crossed again i had our two horses to camp and breakfast waiting it was not until after he fed and he laid in provisions generous that this robber his name was pieface had a word to say he took no more notice of me than if i was dead and when he talked with curly he sat close beside her whispering i hear nothing but allow i thought a heap for this man's face was bad the very look of him was pausing my gun was plenty ready while i watched shock says curly out aloud but her eyes were set on this ladron all the while this pieface says that ten of our boys were sent down to wait for the ransom they were camped at clay flat you remember i ain't much forgetful says i for this meant that all the cowards had deserted we had seen no men at clay flat the chief says curly is right on his ear and sends this pieface to find out what's wrong at clay flat when this pieface person had hit the trail we took both boats across the river and swam our horses from the far bank our way turned sharp to the left into the side canyon of dirty devil creek there we rode along some miles in the water so as to leave no trail then quitting the bottom turned sharp back up a ledge threading the face of the cliffs the heat was blinding it seemed as if we were being baked alive and even my tanned hide broke out in blisters curly allowed this cliff was over six thousand feet high and the trail kept circling round red buttresses flanks of broken rock to one sheer cape where nothing lay below us but blue space then we swung into a little arroyo with trickling water shady trees and a gentle glade until we reached the summit at the rim rock a robber halted us until curly pushed her hat brim up showing her face she answered for me and we rode on through level pine woods i noticed horse tracks scattering everywhere but no trail whatever and then even the horse tracks petered out i looked back and there was not a sign to show the way we had come for the first mile we headed towards where the sun would set now we swung around on a long curve until we pointed northeast i might just as well have been blindfolded curly i asked is this main street i reckon she laughed could she find the way back once before she had told me that no trails led to the stronghold then away to the left i saw a big corral with a dust of horses inside and men sitting round on the top rail maybe a dozen of them beyond it lay a streak of open water and right in front loomed a house set in the standing woods where one could hardly see a hundred paces it was a ranch house of the usual breed log built low pitched banked up around with earth as high as the loopholes and at each end against the gable stood a dry stone chimney two or three men stood in the doorway smoking and but for the fact that they packed their guns when at home they looked like the usual cowboys the dogs were plenty exuberant but curly might have been out shooting rabbits for all the fuss that these men made about her coming we unsaddled and set our horses loose while curly asked one of the robbers got the liquor along nary a smell then mccalmont came round the end of the house dusty after some argument with a bronco trailing his rope while he coiled it so home at last says he shaking a paw with me right hearty well i'm sure pleased at you curly come to repop 
says curly mighty cool but i saw that her eyes were ranging around for jim an olla of water hung from the eave by the door and mccalmont passed the dipper to me first then while curly drank he introduced me to crazy hoss black stanley and his brother dave who made out that they were glad to see me though their looks said different then the captain asked me in and we followed curly through the mess house door the log walls were hung with antlers skins lay on the floor before the big hearth at the end and down the middle with benches on either side ran the long table with its oil cloth cover the tinware set out for supper and knitted to keep off flies that cow camp looked good to me homelike and soothing off to the left of the mess room opened a little lean-to house a cowman's den with a cubby hole beyond it for curly we found her sitting on the bunk gun and spurs unbuckled and holding her legs out for the old man to pull off her chaps i unharnessed myself and he fed me a cigar bidding me to settle in a cowhide chair i felt right to home then dad says curly abrupt where's my jim what you ain't met him says mccalmont he's gone to look for you curly went pale under the tan and gulped how long she asked oh quite a time why child what scared you perhaps he's with my boys at painted desert daddy i've brought bad news i reckon mccalmont spoke very low i've been there before a few times and yet we've worried along lie down so you'll get more rest he sat on the edge of the bunk his hand on hers as she lay loosen out her bit by bit the story of the ransom lost the federal government on the warpath ten good men deserted he was all crouched up when she finished the stub of a cigarette burning his fingers and he looked very old i went to get the newspapers which i'd kept in my war bags for him and when i came back he turned loose a volley of questions searching me to the bones until he had all the truth well well he said at last with a queer smile these year official parties seem to be taking quite an interest eh i thank you sir and i'm full satisfied then he stood up you must be kind of hungry mr davies suppose you just interview my cook i think that you and him has met before and won't need introducing my son and i will join you presently i strayed out through the mess room and found the kitchen beyond sure enough the cook and i were acquainted although i had not expected to see this particular person in shirt and overalls and his bare arms white with flour he was plenty absorbed too dipping balls of chopped meat into a pan full of mess how are you sir he shied right off his feet and turned to face me looking as guilty as a cock fox i guess as much he gasped all blackguards are bound to flock together here glad to meet you mr ryan says i then he collected himself for war state your business and get right out of here i'm engaged i'm engaged likewise i sat down on a box and a dog came fawning to me whereas this dog is polite and sets an example he's plumb full of decorum and deportment i hardly know what possessed me ryan's looks perhaps or the way he guarded those meatballs i grabbed the nearest and fed it to the dog so quick that ryan had only time enough to give himself dead away leave that dog alone says i he quit resisting me then back to the log wall and stood glaring i've noticed says i in dogs that the smaller the dog the larger the bark i knew one once so small that he didn't have room to hold his bark and the recoil thar from threw him back three dog lengths you seem to suffer a whole lot from your recoil mr ryan i guess he said in his harsh yankee twang that you're a low-down coward torturing me because you know i'm helpless that dog says i is actin sort of queer eh as to my being a coward mr ryan you'll remember the last time we met i came buttin along to your hotel in grave city commenting on your proceedings with a straight tongue 
and guns to back the same come to the point says he now this year is what i'm trailin's up to sir that i bears neither guns nor malice calls no names bridles my tongue severe treats you with plenty and gentle inquiries where do you keep your manners where you keep your honesty says he sort of sarcastic you know i can't escape so i've got to listen talk my good man and when you're through you can go the town scout still had his office manners a lot contemptuous he climbed up on top of his vanity like a frog on a ladder to call me my good man and yet i had tamed him enough for business i take notice says i that on the shelf above your head there's a tin of rough on rats this condiment is maybe unusual in meatballs and it seems to affect your dog some poignant with wiggles and froth on the jaws it's well enough too i likewise remarks that there's enough of these high-flavored meatballs to go through mccormick and all his riders may i politely ask how long you been cooked for this ranch mind your own business which is to further test these same delicacies by trying a meatball on you he grabbed a long butcher knife from the table try it says he maybe i'd better call in captain mccallum shall i shout for him ryan dropped the knife what do you want to know how long you have been cooked since yesterday i've been helping a man named pieface why did he quit got a note by carrier pigeon he was in charge of mccallum's pigeons you found the note after he left yes hand it over he said bad words i notice says i that the meatball has finished with your dog he took a slip of paper from his hip pocket no ransom i read warn the boys were the boys warned no the news made you sort of desperate they'll kill me when they know so you took precautions first why do you torture me prefer a meatball no answer i might be induced to hide away these delicacies also this i kicked the dog's carcass in fact to help you son you could bury the past and resign your post as cook the news will come out and i'll be murdered anyway what's the good there being no ransom says i the use for you here ain't much conspicuous as a cook you're precarious too suppose i get you turned loose i'll pay one hundred thousand dollars the day you set me free in the nearest town how could i tell the poor brute that he had not a dollar left in the whole world two hundred thousand says he and that's my last word a man came to the door behind me which opened on the yard there hung a long iron crowbar bent up in the form of a triangle the man began to beat this with a horseshoe and the sound would carry maybe a quarter mile name your own terms says ryan come name your price you does me too much honor says i for how could i tell him the facts what do i care for your honor ryan had played like a sneaking coyote before but now he talked out like a man i've bought better men than you with a hundred dollars and now i'm going to insult you with hard cash your price you thief the sound of the gong must have been a gathering signal for men were straying in from the corrals and there was soon a tramping of feet and buff of talk from the mess room at my back do you think says ryan that i'd be under any obligations to such as you i ask no favors i only try to make it worth your while to do what's right for once come have you any manhood in you i appeal to your manhood to save me oh turn your back you hound i ran to my saddle in the yard opened my war bags grabbed out a pad of paper and fountain pen then pushed my way through the growing crowd about the mess room doors until i won back to the kitchen ryan says i set down on that meat block and write down what i say in your own words what new treachery is this he asked if you want to live i answered you'd best get a move on and write the row in the mess room made it hard for him to hear so i drew up close memorandum says i 
and he began to scribble. Dated Robert's Roost, Utah. But this is California. Write what I say. October 13, 1900. Michael Ryan confessed on oath how he had aided and abetted George Ryan in a plot to destroy Balshannon. He confessed to perjury at the Ryan inquest, naming the witnesses and the amounts he paid to each. He released the Holy Cross estate from all claims on the ground of debt, restoring the same to Jim. He swore that Jim, Hurley, and I were not among the brigands who captured him, and he believed all three of us to be innocent. As to these facts, I had to convince him with a meatball, but in the end, he signed. Then I got in a brace of independent robbers to sign as witnesses, so the thing looked mighty legal and satisfying. Meanwhile, in the mess room, I could hear McCalmont calling his wolves to order, and my witnesses went away to hear his talk. Ryan, says I, sitting down beside him, you know the points of the compass? I guess. I'm going to explain the trail to the nearest settlement. See here. So I began to scribble out a map showing the lie of the canyons, the route to where we had left the boats, the signs to guide him beyond. When you see this big butte towering high on the right, I looked up and found he was not listening, for he pointed his ears to the mess room where McCallum talked. You're due to understand, the captain was saying, that this year Ryan made a letter which he sent to his wife. He showed me the letter, and it was sure fine scholarship, telling her plain and clear how to scare up his ransom at once, how to deliver the same, and not make crooked plays to get us trapped. Mrs. Ryan, she got the letter all right, but then some low-lived swab stole it away from her and sold it to the New York megaphone. Ryan let out a sudden cry. That's what's the matter, says McCalmont. And all the private part of the letter got into print, while Ryan confesses how he acted foul to poor young Jim Duchesne. He confesses to perjury and bribe and witnesses and such like acts of rotten treachery which the general public have an entrusted millions of money to this Ryan to hold and invest the same ain't pleased when they learns his private manners and customs or how his manhood proves itself up when tested the public thinks it's been too trustful in confiding big wealth to a felon who is due to be jailed for his sins and gathered into the penitentiary escape says i to ryan oh you ain't got five minutes to live escape says he to penitentiary oh kathleen kathleen he covered his face with his hands while McCallum went on. So you see, boys, that the public closes down on this Ryan and grabs their money and jumps from under sudden, stampeding before the crash. And this poor swab we got in the kitchen, which he can't even cook, ain't a millionaire any more, but a bankrupt, due to get five years' grief for his acts, which is plumb felonious. It seemed as if all the robbers were stunned with the news, for they made no move or sound. Only poor Ryan groaned, and I felt sick, because I knew it was too late for him even to run. Boys, said McCalmont, this news is bad medicine for we all, because we done attracted too much attention. We made ourselves plenty conspicuous, and the United States has awoke to a smell of robbers. The nation has got a move on at last and it's coming up again on us on every side to put our fires out ten of our men has deserted and likewise the pie-faced animal so there'll be plenty guides to lead the attack on this place i reckon our trails are blocked our water holes are held our time is pretty near expired in this world i therefore propose that we divide up what plunder we got in store the same being considerable and all share alike and after that we scatter as best we can those of us who win out of this trap is due to live and those who don't will get a sure good fight i heard a voice call out who brung this news the man who risked his life to bring this news is my friend chalkeye davies at that i whirled right in through the crowd in the mess room and won to mccalmont's side i got to speak says i the captain grabbed my hand boys will you hear him he called 
spit it out says crazy hoss you're sure enough man and we'll hear boys says i if you hold it good to have this warning in time to save your lives i has to say that curly mccalmont done it he acted faithful when ten men and a swab deserted you complete and curly is surely braver than any man i ever seen in this world i speaks for curly and me and for the captain when i say that is a whole lot pitiful to see the way this ryan person has acted straight to own up the wrong he done and played his cards honest in the matter of ransom we ask you to spare the life of this year round crazy hoss reared up swift to open war against me i'll spare him he shouted i'll spare him a gunload of lead what's your game stranger show down your hand and let's see this whole crooked layout i stood at the loophole thar to watch your play i seen you workin over this year prisoner until he's plumb subdued and offering bribes you catch him with a can full of wolf bait pot preparing the same for our supper you feed his meatball to his dog which dies on the floor between you you threatens to stuff another down ryan's throat then he makes him good talk till he signs a paper and now you arises here to recite his virtues plain to save his life show down your game but this time I was facing a matter of twenty revolvers, all a quiver to drive holes through my poor old hide. Some yelled that Ryan had bribed me, some that I was projecting the death of the whole gang by Ryan's poison. I threw up my hand, showing the peace sign quick. After you, I called, always willing to oblige. After you. Shoot first and hear me afterwards, eh? That's right, boys. You see, I pack no gun, because I'm your guest guns were put away you've heard says i from mr crazy hoss how i subdued this ryan and got acquittance for jim to chesney from the charge of murder i'm his guardian boys furthermore you heard from mr crazy horse a plumb truthful account of how i saved this whole crowd from being wolf bait fed to us for our supper the same being considered unwholesome now as to this poor little felon he put up the only play he knew to save himself from being murdered. He ain't a line to fight with teeth or a man to distribute gunfire on his enemies. But his back's to the wall, and he puts up the best little fight he knows about. He, being a sure snake, uses poison, whereat, having drawn his fangs, I takes his side and begs the critter's life. I want to have him for a curio to put in my collection and i offers ten cents for the same which is more'n he's worth boys said mccalmont if this year chalk eye didn't allus take the weaker side he'd be a rich man still instead of an outlaw herdin' with our gang as his last refuge the robbers seemed to like me some better now and a feeling of popularity began to glow on my skin but says mccalmont in the matter of this year snake he acts plumb erroneous if the snake escapes to give evidence he can identify the entire gang chalkeye included go kill that snake crazy hoss rushed to the kitchen gone he yelled escaped so this is your game mr chalkeye kill him kill him halt mccalmont faced the rush against me out roared the shouting back or i fire back you curs deal with his business afterwards we want the snake first where's them smell dogs here powder powder here you rip come on little dog crazy hoss you put on them dogs to the scent track down this ryan and kill him then come back the dogs were put on ryan's trail go get em rip sick em powder tear em and eat em come along boys so the whole crowd poured away to track ryan mccalmont grabbed me by the arm to hold me back you fool he hissed through his teeth come on there's not a moment to lose or them wolves will get you curly curly come out you and fetch chalkeye's gun chalkeye you come quick curly came running from the little hind room with our guns while mccalmont rushed me to the kitchen here he said hold this sack for grub 
not them meatballs says i meatballs is out of season all right he laughed pitching a half sack of flour into the bag which i held then a side of bacon and such other truck as was handy curly you knows whar to take this man come along says curly and i followed tame with a sack on my shoulder until we gained the woods back says curly sudden and dodged for cover while i dropped flat behind a fallen tree looking from under i saw ryan come surging past in front of us screeching like all possessed the smell dogs at his tail and the robbers swarming close behind a near thing that says curly when they had passed creep through under the wall i crept through with my sack and she followed lie low she said we're hidden here from the ranch until we can run some more get out your gun they say that we white men using our right hands mostly is strongest on that side and apt to bear to the left when we don't take note how we run anyway ryan instead of circling south had circled to the left and lost himself then when he found he was hunted went off his head complete he was back in the yard now close beside the house where McCalmont headed him off with a shot from the door, while the robbers spread out, half-circling. They laughed and shouted. "'My turn first, says Crazy Hoss. "'Take off his ear, Crazy.' The shot took Ryan's right ear, then Spotty fired, lopping off the left. The poor brute tried to bolt, but a bullet swung him round. He lifted his hands for mercy, but the next shot smashed his wrist. He screamed, and a bullet caught his teeth. Curly was yelling now, but nobody noticed, for Ryan was down on his knees, and his face was being ripped to pieces. Then I saw McCalmont fire, and one of his dogs dropped dead. He fired again, and killed the other hound. He had saved me from being tracked. Quit firing, he shouted, and the robbers threatened him. Now, he yelled at them, who wants to talk war again, my friend, Davies and me? Come away, says Curly and i crept after her a man's legs are naturally forked to fit on to a horse and mine have never been broke to walk in a foot fact is my legs act resentful when i walk making me waddle all the same as a duck which it humbles me to think of because that curly person loaded a sack on my withers and herded me along like a pack mule until i felt no better than a spavined groaning wreck we must have gone afoot more than two whole miles before we came out at last on the edge of the grand canyon at this place right in under the rim rock there was a hidden cavern a fine big place when you got down there but a scary climb to reach halfway down the rock ladder i grabbed a root which turned out to be a young rattlesnake and was so surprised that i pretty near took flight curly saved me that time from being an angel which leads me to remark that there's lots of people better adapted to that holy vocation than me. It was dark when we got to the cavern, but next morning I saw that it was a sure fine hiding place, the floor being covered with a whole village of old stone houses. There are thousands of cliff villages like this in the canyon country, made by some breed of Indians long gone dead, but this one had special conveniences because you could spit from the outer wall into sheer eternity. Seeing how the robbers were warped in their judgments of me, and the authorities likewise prejudiced, my health required plenty of seclusion then. We stayed in that hole for a week. Curly was restive, quitting me at night to range the woods and visit the ranch, collecting everything useful which was small enough and loose enough to pull. She got four horses into a hidden pasture, with saddles for the same, and chucked to feed us when we should hit the trail. The plunder was good, but the news she brought smelt bad of coming trouble, for the robbers stayed to quarrel over their shares of past thievings. When they broke to scatter, the trails were all blocked with troops, and then they were herded back into the ranch. On the fourth day, I had to make Curly prisoner while from noon to dusk the battle raged at the stronghold and she wanted to go and die at her father's side all that night and the day that followed i kept the poor girl quiet with my gun 
then when the darkness came i let her free i don't like to think of what happened next because i reckon that if i wash my outside i ought likewise to keep my inside clean and tidy with nice thoughts getting our horses curly and i rode back to robber's roost pulling up at the edge of the clearing just as the new moon lifted above the pines the stench of death black ruins white ashes dark patches where blood had dried upon the dust everywhere broken corpses coyotes creeping to cover eagles flapping heavily away my soul felt small and humble in that place black it was and silver under the moon with something moving slow from corpse to corpse in search a live man counting the dead something in the way he moved reminded me i must have known that man but the little partner called to him all at once jim her voice went low and clear across the silence jim End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of curly by roger pocock this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Ferrard. chapter twenty seven a second hand angel scouting cautious and shine wide of settlements except when we had to buy chuck i herded my youngsters up the long trail north we took no count of the distance we lost all tab of dates but camped where game was plenty pushed on when the sun was shining, holed up when the wind was too cold, and mostly lived by hunting. So we rode the winter through and came to the spring beyond, catching maybe more happiness than was good to have all at once. One day, the snow being gone, and the prairie one big garden of spring flowers reaching away to the sky line, we happened to meet up sudden with a pony soldier which he was lying under the shadow of his horse and playing tunes on a mouth organ keeps content with himself his coat was red his harness all glittering fine his boots were shiny his spurs had small cruel rolls he said his chief was his imperial majesty edward the seventh that his tribe was the northwest mounted police and his camp was called medicine hat the same being close adjacent we sounded him on robbers but he seemed plumb ignorant and said there was quite a few antelope if we cared for hunting telling the youngsters to camp i went button along into medicine hat to prospect the same alone it felt mighty strange to be in a town again see the people walking around who belonged there women and children especially but the whiskey i sampled felt right natural and for all my snuffin and snortin i smelt nothin suspicious in the way of a wolf trap so i traded with a lady who kept store for woman's clothing such as she used herself enough to load up my pack horse she certainly selected a liberal to judge by the money i paid when i got back to camp expecting supper i found the kids had been quarrelling so that they weren't on speaking terms and i had to introduce them jim was special haughty but curly got heaps interested in the clothes i bought crowing and chuckling over everything her favorite game was playing at being a lady but now she shied at committing herself shucks she flirted across to the far side of the fire i can't oppress jim in them things i'd get so tame and weak he'd sit on my head you're due to get married says i as sure as sunrise tomorrow so jim ain't caught me yet jim started in to catch her but she jumped the fire to clear him now she defied him complete don't you rush my corral with one of your fool kisses or i'll surely bat your head i ain't laid down my arms yet so she swaggered with her little brown hand on her gun the firelight glowing on her leather clothes and gold bright hair on the flush of her sunburnt skin on milk-white teeth and laughing flashing eyes jim's heart was burning i reckon for he went down on one knee and reached out his arms to her there was only the fire between them 
say you love me curly it can't be helped jim she whispered and her face went grave but i surely love you right in the ranges of the world in grazing in life's pastures i've got to be plumb content with things present which i can grab the same with my teeth instead of hungering after that heaven above which seems a lot uncertain and apt to prove disappointing here i've got horses for sure plenty cows and monte one of my old riders for my partner bear hole is the name of our new ranch with the bull pines of the coconino forest all around us the hoary old volcanoes towering above and the lava beds fencing our home pasture back of the cabin is the spring where curly used to splash me when she washed the cave where she sang to me beside our camp fire the bubble spring the wind in the pines the chatter of the birds and the meadow flowers remind me of her always she has put away her spurs and gun never to ride any more with free men on god's grass because poor soul she's only a lady now and gone respectable last summer it sure makes me sweat to think of that scary business i went to ireland first came civilization which i'd never seen it before cities all cluttered up with so various noises and smells that i got lost complete when you stop to study the trail you get killed by a tram car then there was the ocean a sure great sight and exciting to the stomach mine got plumb dissolute pitching and bucking around like a mean horse so that i was heaps glad to dismount at liverpool that old country is plenty strange too for a plain man to consider for i seen women drunk and children starving and had to bat a white man's head for shining a nigger's shoes it beats me how such a tribe can ride herd on a bunch of empires as easy as i drive cows but if i proceed to unfold all i don't know i'll be apt to get plumb talking when i came up against balshannon castle i found it a sure enough palace which was no place for me so i pawed around outside inquiring her ladyship was to home and i found her settin' in a fold-up chair on the terrace it made me feel uplifted to see her there nursing a small baby crooning fool talk to the same which she patted and smacked and nuzzled all at once wall says she as i came loomin up accidental if it ain't old chalk didn't i tell you orders to come long ago now don't you talk or you'll spoil my kid's morals cause he ain't broke to hoss thieves yes you may set on that stool Kurt says i feeling scared is that your kid sort of i traded for him he's a second-hand angel now just ain't he cute he was a sure cunning little person and thought me great medicine to play with Warris's lordship says i jim's down to the pasture breaking a fool colt and chaka oh you old felon how i enjoy to see your homely face i got good news father's alive yes in new york he writes to say he's got a job at a theatre giving shows of roping and shooting he's the cowboy champion and her voice dropped to a whisper planning enormous robberies he'll steal new york i reckon curly says i suppose i give you good news may i hold that kid just to try now you tame yourself and don't get rarin up too proud then maybe you shall tomorrow tell me your news i handed her the documents which the governor of arizona had made for me himself curly was pardoned the charge against jim was withdrawn and i was to come up for trial when called upon i shall not be called upon so long as i stay good i saw the tears in curly's eyes as she read and her lips went twisty as if she were due to cry surely she said this comes of telling our prayers to god so jim and me is free to go back to holy cross you're free old friend she whispered you must be first to tell jim leave me a while i walked away into the house as if to look for jim 
and crept back behind a curtain watching her she looked away to the west and i knew she was longing for the desert then she kissed her baby on the nose and once again as in the old days i heard her singing where are you from little stranger little boy you was riding a cloud on that star-strewn plain but you fell from the skies like a drop of rain to this world of sorrow and long long pain will you care for your mother little boy far off i could hear the footfall of a horse when you grow this little varmint little boy you'll be riding a horse at your father's side with your gun and your spurs and your hate strong pride will you think of your home when the world rolls wide will you wish for your mother little boy the horse was coming near up the drive when you love in your manhood little boy when you dream of a girl who is angel fair when the stars are her eyes and the winds her hair when the sun is her smile and your heavens there will you care for your mother little boy the horseman brought up half rearing stepped from the saddle then threw his rein in the old range way and val shannon hurried to his wife end of chapter twenty seven end of curly by roger pocock